Welcome. Uh, we are going to get started. I am very excited to be here today for this uh, fireside chat and panel, uh, a half century of equity in medicine. So thank you all for joining us. Uh, my name is Mary Beth Gassman, and I'm a professor at Rutgers University. And I also have the uh, honor of being the executive director of the Samuel DeWitt Proctor Institute for Leadership, Equity, and Justice, which is sponsoring this event today. And um, I want to kind of give you a little bit of an idea of how the event is going to go. Uh, first off, I'm going to do a little bit of a fireside chat with Lewis Sullivan, who I'll introduce in a minute. Uh, we're going to talk for about 20, 25 minutes together, and then we are going to open it up to our wonderful panel, who I'll introduce in a minute. And uh, after we'll do some Q&A with the panel. And then after that, we're going to open it up for questions from all of you. So I hope that you'll have lots of questions. You can use the Q&A feature to ask your questions. I also wanted to make sure that everybody knows that because we are talking about this wonderful new book, we'll fight it out here. Um, there we do uh, have a 30% off code from the publisher and Giselle, who is um, running our tech today, she will put that in the uh, chat for all of you to, uh, to be able to order the book if you'd like to. It's a really wonderful book and I had the pleasure of reading an early uh, draft of it and I've seen, I, I have since read the uh, finished product and it's really, really great. Um, so let's get things started. So first, I want to say welcome uh, to uh, Lewis W. Sullivan. For those of you who don't know him, and I'm not sure how that's even possible, um, he is chair of the Sullivan Alliance to Transform the Health Professions. He's also the uh, president emeritus of the Morehouse School of Medicine, and he is the former U.S. Secretary of Health and Human Services, and he's my friend, and I'm really happy that you're here, Lou. So welcome. Very wonderful to have you here. And I also want to just make sure that folks know um, who our panelists are going to be. We just have this wonderful, distinguished panel who will come up um, shortly with us. And they include Ronnie Lancaster, who is the former senior vice president and chief operating officer at the Morehouse School of Medicine and former senior vice president for government relations at Assurant Incorporated. And we have Wayne Riley, who is president of the State University of New York, Downstate Health Sciences University, and Gene Sinkford, who is professor and dean emerita of Howard University's College of Dentistry and a senior scholar in residence emeritus for the American Dental Education Association. So we have this amazingly distinguished panel today, just um, a wealth of knowledge and information. And I think we're going to get things started. Are you ready, Lou? I'm ready. All right. All right. So um, you have this, I want to talk to you a little bit about this new book, right? You have this new book. We'll fight it out here. And I'm just wondering what inspired you to, you know, write this book? Why this book now? Well, this book represents the history of an association of health professions programs. Uh, it came about because um, uh, I started at Morehouse College to develop the medical school in 1975. At that time, there were two predominantly black medical schools in the country uh, among some 80 odd medical schools. Uh, a month after I started at Morehouse College, I was in Miami at the annual meeting of the National Medical Association. I was invited to meet with their trustees to brief them about the plans for this new school. So I went to this meeting in great anticipation and excitement and positive feeling that I'd be meeting with trustees. And I was very surprised that I found myself in a room of concerned people. They wanted to know what the impact of this new school would have on the two existing medical schools, Howard and Meharry, that had been formed in the 19th century. They had their funding and would we be diluting their funding by coming into being? So I had to explain that what we hoped to do was to enhance the number of of African-Americans and other minorities going into medicine. And we certainly did not intend uh, and you know, certainly would work to be sure that we did not dilute the funding. As a result of that meeting, we thought, well, rather than working in isolation, perhaps we could form an association and work together to expand the level of funding for these schools. Because at that time, and still today, 
predominantly black uh, higher institutions, ed ed higher educational institutions are not sufficiently funded. So in 1977, uh, we worked with Meharry Medical College, Tuskegee Veterinary School and Xavier College of Pharmacy to form the Association of Minority Health Profession Schools with the mission of working to develop new programs that would support what we were trying to do in increasing the number of African-American and other minority health professionals and to bring health services to those who were not being adequately served by uh, the current system. Uh, over the years, this association grew so that by the mid nineties, all of the 12 health professions programs that were primarily African-American were members. Four medical schools, uh, two dental schools, a veterinary school at Tuskegee, and five colleges of pharm pharmacy. So we had a remarkable experience working as an association. And because of the accomplishments of this association and the benefits of institutions working together, we wanted to record this for history. We wanted to be sure that this was down in our records for the nation of something that had been done by minority health profession schools to improve the health system, increase diversity in the health professions, bring services to those in inner cities and rural areas who are not being well served by the system. So we wanted to record that uh, a variety of very positive experiences, some really not so positive, but we learned from all of that. So that's what was the impetus for developing this, this book. Wow, thank you, thank you. And um, I, um, for, for those of you who might not be familiar with Lou Sullivan, I just want you to know that he is one of the best storytellers ever and has just a mind that remembers all of these kinds of things. So thank you, Lou, I appreciate it. Um, I had the pleasure of writing a book with Lou a few years ago, A History of the Morehouse School of Medicine. And um, that's how I learned about his great storytelling. So I really appreciate it. You always remember, like I, the way that you remember things is really wonderful. So here's here's a question I have for you. And that is, so you're, you know, you're bringing these, these organizations and people together um, to, to collaborate. And I guess, was there a model of collaboration or cooperation among institutions of higher education that you followed or um, did, was there anything like this before? Or, you know, what was, what was going on there? Well, there were a number of models that we thought about, um, but the ones uh, that I was most familiar with uh, first was the Atlanta University Center. Uh, this was a center of seven institutions, predominantly African-American. Uh, four colleges, a graduate school, uh, a school of uh, theology. Uh, uh, so that uh, association started in 1929 uh, with this own very inter interesting history. The second model was the United Negro College Fund. The United Negro College Fund, of course, was started in the mid 40s, uh, bringing black colleges together to work uh, to get resources needed by all of them. And so that organization, uh, both of these organizations still exist today. So I said, well, what we need to do is focus the efforts uh, and the attention and the ideas of those of us in the health professions to see if we can form an association, work together to increase the resources that are available to us, not only dollars, but personnel, facilities, uh, and awareness of these institutions. And so that, uh, those were the animating uh, thoughts that we had about forming uh, the association. And those were the models that we had. They were really models in a general sense, but we felt that we would develop our own model. So it worked so that we ended up with the four medical schools, Howard, Meharry, uh, Morehouse School of Medicine, and Charles Drew Medical School, the two dental schools at Howard and Meharry, the veterinary school at Tuskegee University in Alabama, and the five pharmacy schools at Texas Southern, Xavier, Florida a and Hampton, and Howard. So those are the schools that ended up being members of the association, and we worked together, and it still is working together uh, today. I love that. I'm going to have to start taking more vitamins to keep up with you, though, I think, so <laughs> when you're remembering everything. Um, so just just so that everyone knows, the the, the, the book, we'll, we'll fight it out here, is about, of course, the Association of Minority Health Profession Schools. And um, I, I was wondering if you could talk a bit about 
um, there was a publication that the association did in 1983, and it was called Blacks and the Health Professions in the 80s, A National Crisis and a Time for Action. And I'm, can you talk a little bit about that publication and why that publication was influential or helpful? Yes, right. Let me um, give a couple of uh, uh, background um, uh, things that uh, were going on at the time. I started in the mid 70s at Morehouse College to develop the medical school. Uh, and the association started in 1977, two years after I began my work at Morehouse College. This was uh, on the back end of Lyndon Johnson's Great Society, because during the 60s, we saw this plethora of legislation that came uh, out of Washington uh, with Medicare, Medicaid being formed. We had a number of new health profession schools being developed around the country because in, the, in 1950, we had 80 medical schools in the country. By 1981, we had 127 medical schools. So 47 new schools came into existence in the second half of the 20th century. In, the, in, the, in fact, it was during the third quarter of the 20th century. That was because in the 50s, there were studies that indicated that we would be facing a doctor shortage if we did not increase the number of physicians and other health professionals training, trained. So that effort to develop new schools was a, an effort led by the federal government with funds coming from Washington for expanding the class size of existing schools or to develop new medical schools. So as a result of this, Morehouse School of Medicine came along during this period of expansion. Also during the 60s, the voter rights uh, legislation occurred and voter registration activities, the activities of the civil rights movement that really brought to the attention of the American public the health and other social inequities that existed in our country and the determination to do something about it. So these two major forces, federal legislation to expand uh, medical education and education of the other health professions and civil rights legislation to really get rid of the social uh, inequities that existed in our country at the time. So those were some of the things in the background uh, that, that were there. So as we worked, uh, we felt that to really explain what was the mission of the Association of Minority Health Profession Schools, we would need, needed to bring all this data together uh, in a place that we could leave behind when we met with a member of Congress or with the head of a foundation or other individual uh, that we were asking for support, something that would describe uh, what we were talking about, the number of health professionals, the percentage representation uh, in the population, the health status of Blacks and others, because Blacks had a shorter life expectancy, higher death rates from cancer, heart disease, diabetes, other things, higher infant mortality rates, higher maternal mortality rates. So we felt that we needed to have a publication that we could leave with a congressional uh, staff member or a member of Congress or foundation head so they could look at this at their leisure and understand all of this and so why we were making the request that we were making. So that's what led to us uh, having this study done by Ruth Hamp who had retired from the Department of Health and Human Services. And she did a marvelous job in bringing all of this together. So that publication, which came out in 1983, was the one you referred to, Blacks in the Health Professions uh, in, the, in the 80s, a national crisis and a time for action. The shortages that existed and our plans for addressing that shortage and how the person we were addressing, whether he was a legislator or a mayor, or councilman, or foundation head, or, or corporate CEO, what they could do to help address this. We were committed, we had the intention, we had the talent, we had the personnel, but we needed the financial resources. They could really help make these changes in a very positive way if they joined forces with us. So that was the rationale in developing the publication. And that publication, uh, we actually presented to Secretary Margaret Heckler in March of 1983, when we met with her to tell her about the association. And we gave her a copy of this publication saying that we needed to have 
her help and her leadership as head of this health agency in bringing about changes to address these deficiencies. So she took that, she said this was very interesting. And of course we had a, a great meeting. We had um, uh, with me, uh, David Satcher, uh, uh, who was then at Meharry, uh, Walter Bowie from Tuskegee, and Al Haynes from Charles Drew uh, a Medical School, uh, and John uh, Townsend from Meharry. So we had this meeting with her, and she was very cordial, but we left the meeting and we wondered, were we really just being treated nicely, or would something come from that? Well, something did come from that, because two years later, the publication came from the department uh, that was called the Heckler Report. Its formal title was uh, Black, Black and Minority Health. Uh, and it was a committee headed by Tom Malone, who was deputy director of NIH. Tom Malone was a biologist, very distinguished African-American himself, the most senior African-American in the department at that time. So this, depart, this report, the Heckler Report, was released, and we then uh, had a number of meetings around Washington and elsewhere to have all of these figures really given to the public and to the Congress for things that should be done. So that's how that came about. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And um, you just, uh, I'm always talking about the importance of public scholarship and how important it is to do um these kinds of reports because they really can make a difference and sometimes it's a hard sell with faculty but I just want to say that um, I'm so glad that this report was done because I'm, I can see that you know it, it did a lot to move things forward so uh, one, one yeah. thing I might add we actually had a campaign to see that this report was read Judy Miller Jones uh, figure in Washington who had a number of seminars we were able to engage her and she knew the people to invite uh, and to really give a high profile to these findings. So this was an effort to bring the data together in a publication and to do everything we uh, could to see that the publication was read and would have an impact. And it did pay off. Oh, great, great. Um, okay, so I have one last question before we head on uh, over to the panel as well. But um, so, in terms of um, the uh, Association of Minority Health Profession Schools, what are your because what are your projections, I guess, for the future of the organization? My projection is that the future uh, will be very bright, but only if the members of the association are very aggressive in bringing to the attention of the public what the needs are and what are the strategies for addressing uh, those, those needs. Uh, they won't happen automatically. And one of the things that has happened with the association, all of the members and the institutions have worked to make sure that a number of things happen. And of course, we'll be talking about some of those things, uh, but we have the data to show the, the, the changes that were made, the programs that exist now that did not exist before as a result of our, of our efforts and the impact of those programs have. We've made a lot of progress, not enough, not as much as needed, but uh, we need to continue to keep uh, our attention on, on the goals and working towards those goals. But um, indeed, uh, the association has had a number of successes that we'll talk about. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, I'm gonna ask um, Giselle if you can move, uh, our wonderful panel, Ronnie Lancaster, Wayne Riley, and Jean Sickford, um, back to, as panelists. And um, Lou, thank you so much. I always love learning from you and hearing you. Uh, and I'm going to have a bunch of questions for everyone else. So um, and if panelists, if you can turn your cameras on, that would be great. Thank you so much. One of the things while, while we are uh going through this transition, I would emphasize as a person, personal perspective, but I think it's shared by a number of people. This publication really is an effort to see that our history is recorded, uh, the accomplishments are noted, and they are used to be, uh, build things in the future to address issues that we'll be facing five years, 20 years from now. So that's why I'm so pleased that we're able to 
have this publication come out about the association, not simply to say what we've done, but to say what should be done in the future to mm -hmm. do address the problems that we will have at that time. Absolutely. Thank you. As a historian, I really appreciate that. So thank you so much. Okay, so we are going to, we have this wonderful, wonderful panel. And just to remind you, of course, uh, Lou Sullivan is with us, but um, we have uh, Ronnie Lancaster, uh, again, who is the former senior VP and chief operating officer, officer at the Morehouse School of Medicine. We have Wayne Riley, who is the president of the State University of New York. Uh, Downtown Health Sciences University, and we have Dean Sickford, who is Professor and Dean Emeriti of Howard University's College of Dentistry. So um, just uh, wonderful people with lots and lots of expertise. And the first question I wanted to ask, and I'm directing this, uh, this question to Lou and Ronnie, is what are some of uh, AMP's uh, most significant achievements from your perspective? And uh, whoever would like to go first, please do. Well, why don't I start? There are a number of achievements, but I would say among them uh, is the fact that there exists now mm -hmm. the National uh, Institute for Minority Health and Health Disparities that uh, became uh, an institute in the year 2010. Uh, that was the result of uh, several things. First, when I became Secretary of Health and Human Services in 1989, I created the Office for Research in Minority Health at NIH. By the way, I should mention that Secretary Heckler created the position of Deputy uh, uh, Assistant Secretary mm -hmm. for Minority Health for the department, sitting in the Secretary's office to look at not only the public health service and Medicare and Medicaid and Social Security, uh, but uh, that was what she did. But I built upon what she started by creating the Office for Research in Minority Health, but that became an institute, I'm sorry, became, yes, and became a center in the year mm -hmm. 2000 as a result of the efforts of the association, working with members of Congress, people like uh, Bill Friss, uh, who is Senate Majority Leader for a, a, a time, Congressman Louis Stokes uh, from o o Ohio, Arlen Specter from Pennsylvania, and others. So it became uh, a, a, a center in the year 2000, but we continued to work and had it elevated to an institute mm -hmm. that in the year 2010. So that institute, which celebrated its 10th anniversary in the year 2020, uh, exists now, the youngest institute out at, at mm -hmm. NIH. Mm -hmm. so that's only one of a number of, of programs. We have a research endowment program that also came into being uh, that provided support to strengthen the research activities at these institutions so that they can focus on new knowledge uh, to address health conditions disproportionately affecting minority populations. So, and I'm sure Ronnie uh, can add uh, to that. Well, Mary Beth, um, thank you for the question. And, and it gives me an opportunity to uh, actually thank you and Rutgers University for the chance to, to be with, uh, you know, my mentor, Dr. Sullivan, and my uh, dear friends, Dr. Riley and Dr. Sinkford. Um, two scholars uh, about whom I have uh, great affection and, and admiration. Your question um, is an important one, and, and let me just say as a, um, as a predicate to your question, um, why was uh, it necessary uh, to form the association, to add to Dr. Sullivan's comments, um, and, and uh, what, what really was uh, the impetus? And I, and I would simply say that um, you as a historian, particularly of HBCUs, will understand and appreciate this. Um, our health profession schools, um, not surprisingly, have a, a unwavering commitment to excellence. Um, and coupled with that, uh, they had a, a mandate to serve some of the sickest and poorest citizens of our country. Um, now, when you have those two things, clearly what you need is are high levels of funding. Um, and our schools, not surprisingly, uh, did not have access to traditional sources of funding, particularly philanthropy. We, our schools did not have access to, um, to, to um, transformational uh, levels of funding. And so our schools, as Dr. Sullivan outlined, um, had to be quite creative. Um, an example, for example, uh, of not having access to traditional sources of philanthropy is uh, at Morehouse School of Medicine, we were building um, 
a new center, a national center for, uh, for uh, excellence. And it was a $21 million building about 15 years ago. Um, and Dr. Solomon approached uh, the Woodruff Foundation, uh, which is uh, effectively the Coca-Cola Foundation money. It's the largest foundation in Atlanta and in the Southeastern United States. And they were very generous in giving us a million dollars for our building, for our $21 million building. But that same year, they, they gave, they wrote a check for $300 million to Emory's uh, University School of Medicine just for their endowment. And we were grateful to receive the support from, uh, from, from Woodruff, but it does give you an example of the kind of challenges our institutions uh, face when they had the, uh, as I mentioned, the coupled mandates of commitment to excellence as well as serving um, the poorest among us. Now, just very quickly, just to add to Dr. Sullivan's comments, uh, the genius of the association was that uh, first it, it worked in a very collaborative manner and it went about in a systematic way to identify the, the most pressing needs of, of, of of our institutions and our schools shared them. Um, the, perhaps one of the earliest was infrastructure uh, and we worked together to create a program um, and authorization in the Higher Education Act. Uh, we refer to it as Title III, which provided needed funds for infrastructure, physical infrastructure. We also then created um, a program uh, in the NIH uh, authorization bill to create something called the Research Centers and uh, Minority Institutions, RCMI which helped to create uh, research infrastructure. Uh, we also then created uh, scholarship assistance in Title VII uh, in the HRSA, the Health Resources and Services Administration authorization. And then finally, um, as Dr. Sullivan was mentioning, mentioning, we created an endowment uh, program, research endowment, which as not only helps to build uh, support for research in our institutions, but added a measure of stability, fiscal stability, which our institutions had never enjoyed, and frankly, without which had uh, faced and would have continued to face, um, you know, ex existential challenges. Thank you, thank you so much. I really appreciate that from both of you. I want to direct another question your way, and um, Ronnie, I think you alluded to a little bit of this, but I'd love for you and Lou to talk about this, and that is. So um, when we're talking about, you know, money and resources, right, um, what was your strategy in advocating for the development of new federal programs and also annual appropriations of funds for existing programs? I'm curious about that because that is something that um, organizations that support African Americans are still struggling with, right, and still um, working really, really hard to get uh, resources. Well, let me comment on this and I'll let Ronnie fill in on that. This uh, allows me to show the genius of our association. Uh, we were 12 health professions programs scattered in Georgia, Tennessee, Texas, Florida, Louisiana, uh, Virginia, and Washington, DC. Uh, we actually uh, would come up with the idea, debate it, uh, analyze it, and really develop as tight a rationale as we could for it. Then once we agreed that we would try and get this enacted, uh, I would work on the Georgia delegation to the Congress, our two senators and our representatives. Uh, Dave Satcher or John Maupin would work on the people from Tennessee. Um, uh, Tony Rochelle uh, or Norm Francis at Xavier would work on the Louisiana delegation, Fred Humphreys, at Florida a and we would work on the Florida delegation. So we would get our state delegations really supporting this. And we also would approach the Black Caucus. This is where Congressman Louis Stokes, who was on the Appropriations Committee, was always very helpful and very uh, supportive of what we were trying to do. Then we had other friends. I mentioned Arlen Specter, uh, who was a very good supporter of our efforts. Uh, and also um, uh, many other members of Congress um, uh, such as um, uh, congressmen from Washington uh, State and and, Ar and Oregon, their names will come back to me in just just a moment. So we Magnuson, yeah, Magnuson, right? Yes, and so and others. So we would have uh, this uh, quite uh, diverse group of members of Congress who understood what the realities were that we were facing, and who were committed to working with us but we would give them something specific uh, that we needed 
and the rationale for it and what it would ac accomplish if we were to get it. So they would work together. And so by that kind of network, we really were able to leverage uh, uh, these ideas in a very significant uh, way. And of course, Ronnie, uh, who was our political strategist uh, and spent many hours walking the halls of Congress, as well as the White House and the agencies uh, would really work on this as well. So Ronnie, you could uh, expand on those remarks. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sullivan. I, I would uh, just add quickly that in addition to what Dr. Sullivan described, it, it was the, the energy and commitment of the deans and presidents at these institutions, which uh, and their and their commitment to get their representatives engaged. Um, it was it was that plus the data, Mary Beth. Um, when we argued for the creation uh, to elevate the Office of Research and Minority Health to a center and ultimately to an institute, um, we used NIH data uh, to, to make the case. And the data showed that less than, using NIH numbers, less than one half of 1% of all extramural funding from NIH went to African-American researchers, whether they were at Howard or Harvard. And, th and that, of course, was appalling. Um, and, and when you marry that with, you know, the other data that Dr. Sullivan mentioned, the, the fact that African-Americans um, and poor whites, frankly, uh, and other people of co color uh, have suffered from excess morbidity and, and, and premature mor mortality and have one and a half times to two and a half times the incidence of stroke, diabetes, cancer, heart disease, infant mortality, and, and the like, that data uh, is compelling. And so when you combine the energy uh, of the elected officials with the data, uh, it simply compels people to move forward uh, and create these programs. Thank you. Thank you both. Uh, so um, I hope everyone's listening to that. So, so important, especially uh, I know that um, even you know recently when we've looked at NIH data, not a lot changes, right? So. Um, really, really important. So I want to direct a question to um, both uh, Wayne and Jean. And that question is, um, so where uh, is the health professions in terms of equity today? Um, so what's going on today? And whoever would like to answer first. Well, uh, first of all, Professor Gassman, thanks for all the great work you've done at Penn and now at Rutgers. Uh, you are the leading scholar of uh, High, black higher education. So uh, salute to you and your great team uh, oh, at the Proctor Center. Um, I, I'm here because of Lou Sullivan. Uh, I am a proud graduate of, of Morehouse School of Medicine, 1993. It was uh, a, an, an amazing experience to study at a, a then a small, uh, but very mighty medical school uh, that has continued to grow and develop because of the vision of Secretary Sullivan Delighted to be here with Ronnie and, 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 and Jean as well. Um, I come at this from a couple uh, angles. I am a past chairman of the board of the association um, and I led it during the time when President Obama had just uh, entered office. And Lou alluded to the fact that one of, I think one of our greatest achievements that he laid the foundation for during his tenure as secretary was the fact, is the fact now that we have a full-fledged institute at NIH devoted to minority health. Um, and that was not something that was easily done. Um, as you know, it became law because it was tucked into uh, the Affordable Care Act. And, but this was not something that, that happened just because President Obama was president. It was because Lou Sullivan laid the tracks for it. It just took longer than we wanted. And, uh, you know, the, the, the hidden secret about this, Professor Gassman, is that at least three or four NIH directors were very lukewarm about creating an institute totally devoted uh, to uh, minority health. Uh, their rationale was, well, we're doing it in NCI, we're doing it in NIDDK, we don't need to do that. Maybe the scholarship isn't all that great around Black and minority health. So this is, I think, an underestimated uh, success that I think Lou is the, the catalyst, the progenitor of, if you will. Um, and it leads to what you just asked. Uh, the state of health equity in, in medicine is, is good, but not great. Uh, we've made progress. 
Um, I think we have to be objective and sober about that, but we've not made enough progress, I would argue. Um, the CNN report just uh, within the past 24 hours, only 5.7% of African Americans uh, are uh, physicians. Um, you know, uh, we're probably probably less than that in dentistry. Gene will probably share that. 3.4%. Mm -hmm. Right. Even mm -hmm. less healthcare administrators, mm -hmm. something Lou and I and Ronnie are, are terribly worried about, that we just don't have enough um, Black and Latino administrators of health systems and health organizations. That's another missing ingredient in terms of diversifying the health professions that I know Lou, Lou talks about. So sure, we've made some progress, but you know, if you think about when you measure it against the amazing progress that the rest of the uh, medical establishment, quote unquote, has made, it's still not enough. Mm -hmm. Thanks, thanks, Wayne. You you said what I just said, wanted to say. First of all, thank you for having me on this panel. Uh, I've worked with Lou Sullivan for so long. He was he was building Meharry at uh, his school at Morehouse. Meharry was expanding, and I was the new dean of dentistry at Howard University. Our goals were the same. Our mission was the same. Our disparities, uh, we could speak for the nursing pharmacy and, and across the health professions. We were we had a short, shortage of minority dentists. We had a tremendous shortage of, of uh, health professionals, uh, dental health professionals in the, in the health profession shortage areas. And, we, and that is still a, a um, figure that we like to talk about, but we don't do very much about. We have 90 million Americans in areas that are, have lack access to the repair. But we know two things. We know the students that are, are at Harry and Meharry and the, and the minority medical schools are committed to going back to their, their communities and practicing in their communities. So the social commitment is already built into our curriculums and into our track record of, of where our, our graduates practice and the kinds of practices that they conduct. The other thing I wanted to stress is the Heckler report was very important to us. Dr. Sullivan from that time has, com has committed uh, a steady growth in, in, in community uh, access, but also in collaborative uh, efforts to pull together not only the minority institutions, but to get the resources that we need to move forward and to make a difference. We say we, we're not there yet, we're not there yet, and the country is not there yet. It's not just a black issue; it's a minority issue. It's a women's issue. It's a HTV. Uh, it, it's a LGTB issue because all of the minorities have been. Because we say we have a good health system in the country. Yes, it's good for those who can afford it, but so many individuals do not have access. But our schools have tried to recruit. We've tried to develop individuals. We've tried to de de deal with li uh, leadership uh, issues. We've tried to uh, uh, overcome access to advanced training because our students were not being admitted to schools. They were not being admitted to advanced training programs. And so the pipeline was so short and we talked about the pipeline, but we also were, were talking about lack access to care in our communities and the academic community piece has, has we worked hard with it, but we're away, away from being able to assure that our quality is in our research is sustained, but also that we build the strength in our communities for, for understanding and, approve, and appreciating our healthcare access and also quality of care as it relates to longevity and survival. Thank you. So, so I'm I'm so pleased. If you if you don't read the book, it's a it's it will be a piece out of your your mentality because he he does very well chronicle the issues, the process, what was the effort that went into into the strategies. But I tell our younger people the effort is still has to be there. We're we're going to be passing on 
what we've learned. So don't re, um, reinvent the wheel, but take what we've learned. The data is, is available as data is important, but also the energy to move the, the data forward and make it meaningful as it relates to change. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. So I have another question for um, Wayne and Jean. Um, I guess I'm wondering if you can talk a bit about how medical schools, um, medical schools in general, and also um, HBCU related medical schools, I'd be in pr particular be interested in, but how are they addressing equity in the classroom? And this could be medical schools, dental schools, Jean, because I know your background, yes. but but um, how do they? How are they right now addressing equity in the classroom? Any thoughts on that? Whoever would like to go first. Well, I, I can I can talk a bit about it because we that's what we would. I was at the American Dental Education Association for twenty eight years. Wow. We we had no no uh, infrastructure there for for dealing with uh, cultural competency or with uh, academic community partnerships. And we have been able to secure funding for programs to, uh, to give to schools to actually change their curricula, which would allow them to not only um, uh, uh, address patient needs, uh, um, because we're so uh, disciplined and we're so siloed, we have tried to reduce the silos to ha have collaborative uh, uh, training sessions but also community uh, input into that, those changes. So we have focused on commu academic community partnerships for change and also curriculum changes. Thank you. Yeah, I, would, I would follow that, um, Professor Gassman, with, um, you know, I had the wonderful honor of serving as the president of the Harry Medical College uh, for almost seven years. And, you know, when I think about equity, when I was president of the Harry, it would probably resonate with both Ronnie and Lou. Um, there's, not a, there's not a problem the Harry Medical College had during my tenure that could not have been solved or ameliorated by more money. More money. Mm -hmm. uh, it is, you know, that is the difference that people ask me, what's the difference between when you were at Meharry and now that you're, you know, leading a very large state university uh, Health Sciences University in the biggest city in the country. And it, it comes down to resources um, and the tools that I have that I could never envision having, having while I was president of Harry. Now, in, in other words, the, the success of, of AMPS and Lou's leadership along with uh, the others he mentioned, the research endowment program was started to try to jumpstart and catalyze research capacity at uh, at Meharry, Morehouse, Howard, uh, um, Tuskegee, et cetera. It became so successful that one of my first major grants within the first year of my presidency here at Downstate is that we at Downstate got a $10 million research endowment um, because we used it, uh, the, the criterion were broadened and I saw the opportunity for us to do, even though there, our institution is, is a majority uh, 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 is not a minority uh, institution. We serve a large minority population in central Brooklyn. And so we have been successful in getting that research grant to help grow researchers who will focus in on research capacity uh, for our Afro-Caribbean and African American populations and to grow capacity amongst our faculty, et cetera. So that's an equity play that I think the AMPS organizations uh, should get the credit that even non-minority institutions are benefiting by the great work of AMS. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yes. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so uh, the other aspect too is that the students, you know, you asked about students in terms of when they show up, do they get health equity? They absolutely do. I, I have been gratified by the, the, the passion, the drive, the interest mm -hmm. of our students coming into our Health Sciences University who are passionate about health equity, whether as Jean said, it's uh, providing LBGT care, uh, free care in our free clinic, um, asylum care. We have our student groups that are really leaning into providing health care to asylum seekers, uh, the, the unhoused. Uh, it's just amazing students come in with this amazing um, equity lens that we, that I'm sure Luke could have only dreamt about. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, yes. mm -hmm. Gene as well. 
So yeah. that's the good news. Now that means that the institutions have to meet the students where they are. Yeah. And sometimes we, we're, we're a little bit flat-footed as institutions to meet our students where they are in terms of their uh, progressive view of health equity. But again, um, the accrediting bodies um, have sort of laid a framework. Uh, the LCME virtually requires medical schools to have equity curriculum and equity ex exposure for their students. The uh, uh, DIA does the same thing in terms of dental education. Mm -hmm. So I think, again, the catalyst for all of the this progress in, in, in equity and in healthcare, if you will, has indeed been the leadership of AMPS, the leadership of Secretary Sullivan, the leadership of uh, the late great Secretary uh, Heckler, um, this is, we're now seeing the evidence and the blooming of those seeds that were planted maybe 30 years ago. Thank you. Thank you so much. So I, I'm going to ask one last question of everybody on the panel, and then we're going to, we have a lot of questions from the audience, so we're going to take some of those. But the last question I wanted to ask the panel is, so if you could make one change in terms of medical education, I kind of think I know what the answer is here from some of you, but that one change that would enhance the experiences of people of color, what would it be? So I'm curious, and I'll start with you, Lou, what, if you could make one change in terms of changing uh, medical education that would enhance the experiences of people of color, what would it be? Well, well, thank you very much. Let me, before answering that, make expand on a comment that Wayne made, and that is this. Many of the programs that AMPS has brought into being are actually benefiting majority institutions as well and benefiting mm -hmm. the broad yeah. population not only the endowment program, but the RSUMI program that has research in research centers at minority institutions, number of state uh, colleges and universities have those programs. There's something like 38 or 39 RSMI programs scattered around, around the country. So what we're doing is not limited simply to minorities, but to the broader population as well, particularly those who are poor. The other thing I comment on is when the office was elevated to a center in the year 2000, it became the National Center for Minority Health and Health Disparities. Health Disparities was tacked on uh, by the uh, Senator um, from West Virginia uh, with Rob a seat. Robert Byrd. Yeah, Robert Byrd. Robert Byrd said, those things that you're addressing, my population, which is predominantly white, suffers from these as well. So it was at his suggestion that we accepted that it was named the National Center for Minority Health and Health Disparities. So, so those things uh, uh, really benefit the broader population. Now, to, to respond to your question about what one thing would I uh, like to see change? Well, there are a number of things I'd like to see change, but perhaps uh, among the top two, I, I can't limit myself to one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> top two would be as follows. One, to see that uh, the debt burden of minority students uh, or medical students in general can be reduced by medical schools and other health profession schools really working harder to see that, that they can really uh, provide uh, educational uh, programs uh, and keep tuitions and other costs from not going up. And secondly, having more uh, scholarships uh, available. When I was a medical student uh, years ago, I had scholarship support. So whatever I've been able to achieve is really because there was scholarship support uh, for, for me. So we need to do that if we're going to have poor students and minority students becoming health professionals. That's important because among other things, we need to develop better trust, better communication, better understanding between our health system and our minority population so that minorities will not be intimidated by the system. They'll come into the hospital or to the health center. They'll get those prescriptions filled. They'll listen to the doctors because they feel that the doctor is giving uh, them good advice. So we need to have those things to change that because part of being healthy means having a health literate population and a population that trusts the system. The COVID pandemic has shown the lack of trust uh, in great detail. Marvelous vaccine developed 
but a tremendous level of non-use uh, because of lack of trust. So those are some of the things that I think would change things more. Having more diverse faculty uh, with African-Americans, Latinos, Native Americans will tell those students, I can be that doctor, I can be that neurosurgeon, I can be that hospital administrator. So those are some of the things I'd like to see. I like it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ronnie, what about you? Yeah, Mary Beth, not surprisingly, I, 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 I would simply uh, uh, follow Dr. Selman's comments. I, I would uh, uh, speak about one, and that's dead burden, but just another dimension. You know, when young, uh, bright people are thinking careers, uh, and they're, they're going to faculty and parents and other uh, people uh, that, whose opinions are important, uh, when you look at graduate school opportunities, the three, arguably, the three most popular, there are certainly many others, but if you look at business school, that's a two-year commitment. Law school is a three-year commitment. Medical school is a four-year commitment with many years of residency to follow. Um, when, when, when I was at Morehouse School of Medicine, I know the dead burden of the average graduating, school, uh, graduating student um, was well into six figures, and I'm, I'm sure that it is, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if it's approaching $200,000. Two hundred fifty-five thousand. No. Thank, thank you, Dr. Sullivan. The Morehouse School of Medicine is a school that is very proud of its legacy in training primary care physicians. Mm -hmm. Primary care physicians uh, take care of eighty percent or more of what ails the average person. Primary care physicians are not compensated at the higher end of of, of specialties, and so what that what that does is uh, it drives primary care physicians and others into subspecialty care. And, and what they, the consequence of that is that it reduces access to, to the very populations that we're committed to, to serving. And so uh, for that reason, I think debt burden is, is, is very, very important uh, in terms of preserving and expanding access to uh, populations uh, that, that need care and need access. Thank you. Jean, what about you? Well, Dr. Sullivan has said almost everything I was going to say, but I think <laughs> I had a debt burden at the, at the top. Individuals are graduating with 250,000 debt average in, in, in dentistry. That's almost unthinkable for poor people. I would also talk about, think about the pipeline, how we get through, how we get to those individuals the academic credentialing and, and the nurturing that they need to move through the pipeline to be able to compete to get into the schools, okay? And I would also uh, look at the, the uh, admissions criteria. Yeah, it's written in documents, but when you, when you look at schools that have no African-American dental students, it, it means that there's something wrong with the way we use the criteria and how we implement it and how we assess the uh, value of the quality of, of the educational system at the school that is not meeting the, the diversity criteria that we have in the, in the criteria. And so I would look at the criteria, I would look at the funding, and I would also look at the uh, emerging models that are coming up as it relates to the healthcare delivery oral health care delivery in the communities that uh, are have a lack of care or, in a, or inadequate care. Thank you. You said something <laughs> so important there that, you know, these that uh, medical schools and dental schools that don't have uh, African-American students, um, they, they, they need to reassess um, how they're doing admissions, right? Because there's so I, much- I, it's, not, it's not just African-Americans, uh, African diversity in their diversity students. Diversity in general. And, yeah. they've gotta, and they've gotta have a, a program that, uh, that helps develop that pipeline. They can't wait for Howard and Harry to do it all. They mm -hmm. have got to be a partnership in, and that's why, and Lou Sullivan knows this. We've talked about it so many times, and I and I and I appreciate his ability to express, uh, speak for the other health professions because he knows what is going on. It's it's the same across the board. If you have if you have a nurse in my position today, she'd tell you the same thing. So it's not it's it's systemic, and we and we've got to stop ignoring it, and we've got to get the resource as well. He says we've got to get the resources 
I had, to, I had to spend much of my time raising funds to do even the piece, the small pieces that we could do. Robert Wood Johnson and Kellogg and the California Endowment, these were the private sector funds that we could leverage, but we have to work together to do it. Thank you, thank you. Wayne, what would you change? You know, I think, you know, again, my distinguished colleagues have nailed it. I add to the list the fact that we need to diversify the, the specialties of medicine. Um, this, this is, this is a, another sort of under the radar phenomenon mm -hmm. that I think Ronnie alluded to. But think about it. When was the last time you made, became aware of a black dermatologist or a black ophthalmologist mm -hmm. or a black orthopedic surgeon? Um, this is critically important to making the medical profession more just, is that we have to get Black and Latino uh, medical school students access to the subspecialties. I'm a proud internist, um, love internal medicine, but I also think it's important to have Black specialists mm -hmm. um, where uh, I can refer my patients uh, to see a black cardiovascular surgeon, a black neurosurgeon, a black orthopedic surgeon, a Latino otolaryngologist. I mean, th this is critically important because as Lou will tell you, the power and the politics of medicine have tended to tilt towards the subspecialties of medicine. And that's why I don't want black and Latino physicians of the next generations um, to not be fully participatory in making the medical and healthcare profession uh, more diverse, and I would argue more effective. Uh, thank you, thank you. Okay, well, I hope you're all ready to take some questions from the audience. Um, we've got a lot of different questions. So um, uh, here's a question, and I'm not sure if the AMPS organization, uh, I'm assuming that there's probably some uh, focus on this, but. Um, an interesting question, with a progressively aging population, what is being done for minority elder populations? Just wondering, any thoughts on that? Yes, the, the need for social services mm -hmm. uh, intertwined uh, with health services is, is tremendous uh, because uh, older people really have a variety of needs. Uh, part of them are really adequate uh, access to the health system, but also help in planning uh, for housing, for nutrition, uh, for regular doctor uh, visits, uh, dental visits, uh, et, et, et cetera. So clearly we need to have a system that really takes care of our population because we are getting older. Uh, and uh, we, to really have a good quality of life, we need to have um, those kinds of social support systems so that our seniors can enjoy their years uh, equally as well as the rest of the population. Thank you, thank you. Okay, so here's a question. Wonderful presentation, learning so much. Is there any data about what percentage of NIH dollars are awarded to women of color? Do we know anything about that? Mm. Anybody, maybe not. Well, that's that's an excellent question. That's an excellent question, oh. though it really is. I think they're looking into it now, as as the as the uh, Office of Research and Minority Health has has programs to recruit minorities. So um, we need we need to look at that. That's a really good question. I think R Ronnie mentioned before that for uh, funds going to minority institutions, um, really some minority like researchers. Minority researchers. But, but not necessarily the researchers, because I've, I've been looking at Howard's. Much right. of the funds are not to the minority researchers, but it's to the it's to the program, the the, the disease or the uh, right. So, yeah. so we so we need to look, that question is a good question because I can't answer it, but I I'm very interested because we've tried to improve the uh, the numbers of funds that are going to women researchers that's another question mm -hmm. yes one thing that this reminds me uh we were fortunate that we were able to create the office for research in women's health right uh, during my tenure mm -hmm. as secretary filled by dr vivian penn mm -hmm. who did an outstanding job in developing that uh, program right the number of women included in clinical trials right. uh, for right. answers to certain diseases 
was inadequate. So he right. did not only a good job right. in increasing that, but also in supporting women uh, researchers as, as well. So I'm sure that uh, we, uh, whatever the number is, it's not sufficient. Uh, so that is an area that does need some emphasis. Uh, Mary Beth, I, I, yeah. I had mentioned that the uh, Chronicle of Higher Education had reported uh, years ago that less than one half of 1% went to African-American researchers. That of course included men and women. And mm -hmm. so, you know, I, roughly I no, no more than half of, no more than a quarter of 1%. Uh, this was years later, hopefully NIH is doing much better, but that is what the Chronicle of Higher Education reported using NIH data. Yeah, and, and just to follow that point, uh, I served on a panel appointed by the former director, uh, Francis Collins, when the science article came out, uh, Dr. Ginsler from the University of Kansas pointed out the low percentage comparatively of grant, NIH grants going to minority investigators, even if they are at a non-minority institution. Mm -hmm. That our, our work discovered that science, in particular in biomedical science, even more strongly, tends to have a pedigree bias. Uh, you know, it's not it's it's not overtly racist, but it is based upon if a researcher works in a lab that that particular lab uh, director came from a prominent East Coast institution they tend to score applications at the NIH uh, working groups higher than they do, even if you're a, 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 an African-American researcher uh, at, 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 at outstanding at another institution, you're not treated similarly. And I suspect that in terms of Black women and Latina women, it's probably the same. So here again, I alluded to the fact we're doing better, but we, we're not doing great. This is one area where we're clearly not doing great at all. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I, if I might add to those comments, this paper that uh, Dr. Riley referred to by Dr. Ginter at the University of Kansas showed that first time applicants for NIH R01 grants, investigator uh, oriented grants, the success rate if you were white was 30%. The success rate uh, if you were black was 16%, virtually wow. one half. Where, and they control for levels of training, uh, years of experience, et cetera. But they found this tremendous gap. It was after that that NIH established a program too small, by my uh, uh, estimations, too small to address it effectively, but to try and support minority investigators. We need to do much more of, of, of that because this showed that there was bias in the system mm -hmm. in the part of the system where there's not supposed to be bias, where decisions are supposed to be made purely on merit, but it's found that there was bias in the system uh, at NIH. That's so, right. so Mary Beth, just to follow Dr. Sullivan's comments, um, what of course he was referring to when he, 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 he said, you know, decisions should be based strictly on scientific merit and, uh, and, and with bias removed, as, as you know, um, the decision to award grants at NIH, particularly so-called R01 grants, which is the gold standard, uh, is based on a so-called peer review uh, mm -hmm. process. Uh, this is where panels from, uh, which are populated by individuals uh, that Dr. Raleigh described as uh, pedigree, traditionally we'd recognize, um, th they were, they were uh, minorities and African-Americans were notably absent. And so the book, one of the things the book chronicles, and, and Dr. Sullivan tells the story well, and David Chanoff tells the story well, one of the first things Dr. Sullivan did um, was ordered a, the, the, um, the department, the division of, um, of uh, committees report, reported to Dr. Sullivan. Um, and, and one of his first acts was to call in the person who ran that and ask for a review of diversity on all of those panels. Not surprisingly, it revealed a shocking uh, 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 display of absence of people of color and women. And, and he immediately ordered a rather aggressive uh, uh, expansion uh, to try, including sharing all of this information with HBCUs around the country and AMPS institutions and all institutions uh, in an effort to greatly uh, increase the number of uh, the representation of women 
uh, and minorities uh, of all stripes uh, to include because individuals would uh, on these review committees uh, would 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 see uh, these proposals, but not know anything about the institutions, not know anything about the researchers, and frankly, uh, not give them clearly uh, the credit uh, that uh, that certainly on the basis of merit they deserved. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yes, Jean. You're muted, Jean. On mute. I don't know if it was in, included in the report, because but I know they they were did not have minorities on the review committees themselves. Getting on a review committee was a, quite a challenge because it was almost like a, a closed system. Because if you were not you did not have an R1 yourself, or if you were not, had not had a part of, of training that uh, uh, developed those ind individuals that were appointed to those appointments, it was, they were not there. They were not there. Well, one point I would make is this. Uh, NIH has been around uh, since uh, at least the mid 40s, mm -hmm. 75 years, and there must have been 18 or 19 directors of NIH since then. Mm -hmm. since then. One female, Dr. Bernadine yeah, Healy. Right, Healy. Mm -hmm. uh, honored to appoint her as director yeah. of NIH. She, working with Dr. Vivian Penn, created the Office for, for Research in Women's Health and worked to get women more involved in science uh, and as investigators. And so, right. and so we've made significant progress there, though we need to do more. Mm -hmm. But it's remarkable that with all of the talent that we have among our female scientists and physicians, only one woman has headed NIH in all of these mm -hmm. years. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I got a bunch more questions. Here's a question. Um, uh, and whoever would like to answer this, uh, please answer. Um, there's curiosity about uh, HBCUs and um, the future of HBCUs founding medical schools. So there've been talk of both Xavier and Morgan State having medical schools that will be coming out. And just any thoughts on that? Do you, what, what do you, you know, just your thoughts on HBCUs um, and the founding of medical schools and the impact of, of that on the future of uh, medicine. And also, you know, if, if there are new dental schools as well, but. Well, yeah, I, I just want to salute uh, both Morgan State, uh, David Wilson, President Morgan, and, and Renald Barrett. Uh, I just returned from New Orleans and had a meeting with him, uh, President Barrett at Xavier, uh, to encourage him to do it. Um, it is, we have enough room, we have enough bright young people uh, to fill uh, lots of medical schools, including two new ones at HBCUs. Uh, I, I shared with him, uh, you know, you got to talk to Dr. Sullivan. He's the only man walking on earth who did it <laughs> in, in the 20th century. Uh, so he'd be wise to, to uh, talk with Secretary Sullivan. But yes, our, those institutions have the, uh, the scientific heft, if you will. They have the track record of training uh, health professionals that is a good, a good enough substrate to start a medical school. Now, with that said, it will take resources. Um, you know, uh, you know the, the, as Ronnie knows, there's been other medical schools that have been founded, you know, sort of with a snap of a finger uh, with wealthy philanthropists. Uh, there's one going up in Arkansas right now um, that is being supported by a very prominent uh, philanthropist. I would hope that we're at this uh, level of, of equity in health professors' educations, that there's you know, possibly a philanthropist who will be captivated by these two medical schools and, and step up to support them. So I fully support. Um, and, and, and again, you know, Lou had the experience of trying to justify to prominent African-American physicians starting a third medical school. I hope we're not at that moment where we would have to justify or defend, in fact, uh, the establishment of two additional uh, predominantly African-American medical schools. Well, Jean, you're- Mary, Mary, did, you, you, did you include dental schools? I, because um, we, we, we have on, on the books four more dental schools mm -hmm. uh, anticipated. 
Oh, that's great. And, and we, you know, that, that's great. If those schools, the graduates from those schools are going to deal with the diversity issues that we're talking about. If we just find new schools uh, to uh, follow the old tradition, I would say we, we, we need to step back and see what the, the, um, uh, the model is going to be and what the graduates are going to be committed to because we don't want the same old, same old. We have to have new visions for the leaders at those schools and we have to be assured that those schools are committed to diversity and it was, they're com uh, committed to preventive health care as well as uh, uh, um, advanced uh, training and advanced programs that would uh, uh, be re research oriented. Because I think we have to look at the whole research capacity for, for our schools because research capacity contributes to quality. And we want to be sure that the schools have the quality as well as the funds to, uh, to uh, recruit minority students, as well as the infrastructure for the, uh, for the building, continuous uh, growth of the infrastructure. Thank you. Mary Beth, if I could add, first of all, so far as additional predominantly black medical schools, uh, I certainly am very supportive there because of, of, of the need. And it happens that Xavier produces more young people who are successful in getting into yeah. medical mm -hmm. all over the country than any other school in the country. So they have shown that they can do it at the undergraduate level better than many uh, very endowed uh, majority schools. So certainly they can do it um, uh, at the medical school uh, level. One of the things that helped Morehouse College start a medical school was the fact that in the 1970s, 7% of all of the black physicians in the country had their undergraduate education at Morehouse College. That gave the college the credibility to develop a medical school. That same kind of credibility Xavier has and Morgan State has. And I agree with Jean, we need to have uh, young people who are committed to going into medically underserved areas. And it happens that a study published in the Annals of Internal Medicine in 2006 by Fitzhugh Mullen showed that yeah. the social uh, consequences of the medical school were much greater uh, with the graduates of Morehouse and Meharry <laughs> than majority of schools. So I'm sure that we will have a similar kind of output uh, from Morgan and, and Xavier should they be. Mm -hmm. they so that if anyone is serious about helping to address the health inequities in the system in our country in general, certainly supporting the development of more schools that are predominantly African-American, Latino, and Native American would be very helpful because mm -hmm. if you have a healthy population, you have a wealthier population, mm -hmm. which is good not only for health, but for social stability, wealth development, and a stronger country overall. It's not simply benefiting min minorities, mm -hmm. but our society in general. Oh. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we've got time for maybe one more question. We have tons of questions, but here's a really good one. And that is, what is the role of mentorship in our commitment um, to diversifying medical uh, education and, pro and also providing medical equity? And then sort of um, connected to that, um, mentorship to, to get more um, people of color into leadership roles as well. So any thoughts on that? Absolutely. I, I think it's the secret sauce, Professor Gassman. Mm -hmm. um, the, you know, when I think when you talk to African-American or Latino professionals who have, have benefited uh, from mentorship and sponsorship, it's, it's almost uh, staggering how important that aspect of career development is. And, you know, we talked about the COVID vaccine earlier. And, you know, and this is why I tell a lot of black audience who have hesitancy about the vaccine, for example. Well, the vaccine was in part developed by a great team of African-American scientists working at NIH in Dr. Fauci's lab led by Dr. Kazmiki Corbett. Um, you know, she is a tremendous scientist that was there 
and did some of the pioneering work with Dr. Graham and Dr. Fauci um, at NIH. You know, Dr. Fauci yeah. sponsored and mentored this great scientist. And her career path is now an astronomical because of that. And there's many other examples like that. And I also share with minority students, Dr. Gaspin, look, if you can't wait around for a mentor who looks like you, um, mentorship can come from folks who don't look like you. And many of us have benefited by non-minority mentors. So for African-American Latino students, sure, it's always great if you have a Black or Latino mentor, but don't cut yourself um, too short by not embracing mentorship and sponsorship of someone who takes a genuine interest in you and your career. Thank you. Thank you for saying that. Jean, do you have a comment? I, uh, I've had a, a, a program for women and I've had a program for minorities. And the most important and critical piece of those programs is mentorship. I don't know any leaders that you talk to that can, can say, I got here by myself, okay? But it's the selection of the mentors the commitment of the mentors, and also the, the, uh, uh, the uh, graduate students that we've had have had to have multiple mentors, mm -hmm. mentors related to their scientific development, mentors related to their finances, mentors related to their community uh, engagements. So I, I've seen that, and we've talked about this as it relates to women as well as minorities, the career advancement depends upon their uh, ability to access mentors at, the, at critical times and also to have those mentors, not just uh, sporadically, but seriously committed to the advancement of those individuals and wa watching them along their progression. I got a letter from a student today who has just finished the advanced program who is trying to make a decision related to, the, to his advanced training. He's, he's got so many problems and issues related to his ability to make that transition because he's coming from a minority uh, institution, coming from a, a, a poor background, and all of those things have to be taken into consideration when you are mentoring minorities. It's not easy. I think women have a little easier, um, but uh, whether it's a, a male or a female, it's somebody who has has uh, has your interest at heart and also has the resources can can direct you to the resources that are needed to adv in advancement. And I, I, I would add, I think every one of us who has been uh, fortunate enough to develop our careers, we had mentors. Mm -hmm. By five, I wanted to be a doctor because there was Dr. Griffin mm -hmm. in Southwest mm -hmm. Georgia, whom I knew. And there was never any doubt that I was going to be like Dr. Griffin. But because he existed, I really said, that's what I want to do. You, you, that story you will find if you talk with yeah. almost any yeah. African American uh, uh, physician, businessman, a scientist, et cetera. Having mentors is very important. Mm -hmm. Having, And I agree with Wayne's comments. It doesn't have to be uh, someone yeah. of the same race. Can be, I've had mentors who are white. Uh, who are Latino and others, but Dr. Griffin started me on my pathway. I owe a lot to him. Turns out Dr. LaSalle LaFall, who many of you know, former chairman of Howard, also came from Quincy, Florida. He knew the same doctor down there. Uh, and he was a mentor to the LaSalle LaFall. So mentorship plays a very important role. That's something that everyone can do. So we need to have more of them. Mary, Mary Beth, if I could make yeah. two Two quick comments. I, I didn't comment on the previous question regarding starting medical schools. I because I, I think all of our panelists answered the question so well, but I just add quickly that these medical schools are notoriously expensive enterprises. Mm -hmm. yes. uh, and 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 I agree completely with Wayne, not surprisingly, that no one is better uh, in explaining that uh, than Dr. Sullivan. Um, basic science professors are uh, are expensive. These are the individuals, as you know, who train uh, individuals at the first two levels of medical school and, and clinical faculty are even more expensive. And the kind of challenges and rivalries within the, in, within the institution, it can be you know, really quite, uh, quite uh, challenging. 
Um, so these, these institutions, and I'm sure that they will be, have to be very clear eyed about the prospect of, of committing to this. <laughs> Excuse me, um, enormous, it's an, an enormous uh, challenge of resource commitment and organization. To, to the question of mentoring, um, I agree completely about its importance. And I would just point out that mentoring occurs at, at many levels. It, it not only is the you know, kind of one-on-one -on -one and, and close hand-to-hand, hand-in-glove -hand relationship, but it also is seeing people who look like you on, state, on, on the national stage. And, and, and as Dr. Sullivan mentioned, on the state stage. Dr. Walter Sullivan, uh, Dr. Lou Sullivan's brother, created within AMPS a, a phenomenally successful program called the Biomedical Research Symposium, where the idea was to recruit some of the most um, talented high school uh, and undergraduate students from around the country of every color uh, and to fly them to one of our host cities and AMP schools, 100% paid for. Um, and we raise the money 100, every year to, to, to provide 2,000 students this, uh, this experience. And the kinds of people who we, this, this program became so popular that, um, you know, that it was enormously competitive to get in. Students had to actually apply, make an application, write essays, get letters of recommendation. But the people who came every year, every, every NIH Institute director came, including the head of NIH, cabinet officers, sub-cabinet officers, uh, members of Congress, both House, Senate, Republicans, and Democrats. And importantly, every year, either Keith Black or Ben Carson would come. These were the two uh, most uh, celebrated neurosurgeons in the world. Each of them came um, freely every year to inspire these young people. Uh, and Debbie Thomas, who was a veterinarian, uh, would come often, um, who was uh, also Miss America. And Mae Jameson, who, who was a physician, uh, an astronaut, would come every year. And the list of these individuals was really quite extraordinary. Everyone we invited accepted immediately. Um, and so the, the importance of uh, mentoring uh, uh, took place uh, in, in that environment as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I, I, I wanted to say that throughout my life, um, most of the people who have mentored me have been uh, African-American and other people of color. And I am so grateful because uh, there's no way I could ever do what I do right now if that hadn't happened. So I, I, I'm making a pitch for uh, mentoring from wherever you can get it. If you get could. it. <laughs> it works. It's the secret sauce. <laughs> it is. It's the secret sauce. So with that, I just want to, I want to say thank you to all of you. Thank you so much for all that you've done throughout your careers thus far. I'm sure there's much, much more. And thank you so much for all you've done. Thank you for this great, robust conversation. I'm sorry we couldn't get to all the other questions that were there, but just wanted to say thank you. A reminder, please check out um, this wonderful, wonderful book, which is called We'll Fight It Out Here. There's a 30% off promo code in the chat, and I'm sure Giselle can put it in there again so that everyone can see it. But please pick up the book. It's terrific. And just thank you to everyone. I hope you have a great afternoon. This, again, was sponsored by the Proctor Institute at Rutgers University. Please follow us on Twitter if you're on Twitter because you can find out about all of our programs, which are always free. So um, thank you, everybody. Take very good care. <laughs>